Lebu doesn't know what she hasn't said is that I too have over 20 years in education. So, and, and, and the only thing that I know is in fact education. Because I've been to school and after school I just started working in education. And I'm still in education. But anyway, <clears throat> well thank you so much um, for the opportunity. And I must thank Trialogue for the opportunity afforded to the NECT to be part of this conference. I think it's a very important conference. And as we know, I mean, Trialogue has organized these conferences without failure every year, and I think they're very, very useful conferences. <coughs> I do also want to, you know, just pass my, my view and the view of the NECT about you know, the, the work that Trialogue does. I think Trialogue over the years has served as the heartbeat, you know, monitor of the CSI. I don't think anybody has done this kind of work. And I think it's useful work that actually guides um, the work of many people, including that of the NECT. I find the handbook very useful. I get my copy every year without failure, and I go through it. So as Kathy was presenting, I didn't listen to you, because I've already read it. So I know what's in there from, from the front page to the last one. Uh, we may take it light, but I, I know that the group which is sitting here you know, uses the CSI handbook and this conference to shape what they do in the different parts of this, I mean, this country and the different projects that they get involved in. But I think, <clears throat> although in an indirect way, the, the handbook and the conference find, and the content from there, find its way into policies and programs of, the, of, the, of government. I mean, the NECT as a partnership initiative certainly serves as one of the conduit that passes that information into, you know, policies and, 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 and programs of government. So thank you so much. I think there's much value in, in created by Trialogue in the CSI space. It does not only provide strategic leadership in this space, but keeps the, what I call the candles of hope alight. So, Enough about Trilog. Let me talk about the NECT now. Many of you would know some background about the NECT, so, but I, I take it that some of you would not have you know, background, so I'll give a bit of background about the NECT, but I would largely you know, want to talk about what the NECT has started doing, and, and perhaps you know, at the end, you know, draw some links between the NECT and the CSI CSI work and, and the focus of the conference you know, today, and I hope that you will find it you know, useful. And my picture has disappeared there, but anyway. <clears throat> the, the, the National Education Collaboration Trust is a partnership you know, initiative. Uh, I believe some of you would know where it comes from, but it started with a reflection by a few about where education was and what, at that point, we thought were the big you know, challenges. Uh, but we made sure, I mean, we also looked at what we thought were the successes of the past 20 years and organized a dialogue of people from across the sector, sectors, uh, and at least those people who have interest in education. I think we had a very, very useful dialogue about what we think was working in education, what was not working, and what needed to be done. Uh, so the sorts of things that are discussed in this conference came up. In the end, we came up with a list of about 21 big issues that uh, people thought were blockages in the education sector. And amongst the, in a range of those, amongst those was, you know, you know how unions blocking you know, development or how the CSI activities aren't you know, effectively coordinated or how communities and parents aren't involved in education, resourcing issues, uh, you know, the whole notion of public schools and state schools and how the communities don't feel you know, part of the schools and so on and so forth. I think very, very useful set of issues most of which um, were 
issues that were raised by you know researchers. Uh, so I mean that gave us a big, 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 big focus. And when we finished the conference, or whatever the, the the dialogue, there was an agreement to set up the education collaboration framework. So the, you know the whole idea of the NECT came from the education collaboration framework, which in a sense wanted to respond to the issues that people raised at, at the first you know, dialogue. So, in other words, I mean, to create a way in which we clear the blockages and ensure that the key players you know, work together towards the improvement of education. So that's where the partnership comes from. It's a partnership involving government, business, and a social partners, that includes labor and civil society, uh, that education collaboration framework presents a model which outlines the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholders, which we often take for granted that we, you know, we understand how we should work together you know, as stakeholders. It provides some guidelines on educational programs that we think should be supported by, by um, the partnership. But importantly, <clears throat> it creates a, you know, an implementation vehicle, and that implementation vehicle became the National Education Collaboration Trust, and, and some specific priority areas. I'm not going to go through the framework, but I want to pick up some key you know, aspects of the framework in preparation for you know, the updates uh, you know, on the NECT, as well as the link between the, N the work of the NECT and your work um, as you're sitting around the table. At the core of the, the Education Collaboration Framework, it's an, it's an understanding or a language that we sought to create on how we work together. Uh, I've said earlier on that we often take it for granted, that we understand how we need to work together. But often, you know, those who get involved in the um, education space, the stakeholders that get involved in the education space, often, you know, do what is not, you know, their you know, primary role in the space, and we thought we should at least clarify that. To do that, we divided the stakeholder groups into two. On the one side, government, which includes in the main the basic education department and its nine provincial departments and circuits and districts, uh, you name them, as well as other departments, because the basic education department works with other departments to deliver um, you know, basic education as a, as a constitutional responsibility of that uh, department. The, the second group, we, we, we've put business, labor, and civil society together as, you know, a grouping that involves people who should be assisting in carrying out the, um, the role of, of providing public education. So that's broad categorization. But the key message there was, you know, there is one stakeholder group that carries the primary responsibility to provide public education. So that must be understood as such. The, the, the stakeholder group in itself has certain responsibilities that it should carry. And we too must appreciate the responsibility that that big stakeholder group you know, has. So in sum, I mean, we thought uh, and agreed that you know, the, the government has the responsibility to anchor any partnership and to provide stability, I mean, given that it has the primary responsibility to provide public education. And we recognize the fact that it has the capability, which none of us have, of maintaining the system. The system is large, right? And secondly, it carries that constitutional responsibility to spell out how public education, you know, will, or education in general, will be provided in the country, right? So, um, but by, by so doing, I mean, wanted to emphasize the, the roles of government and those responsibilities of government that we as partners should respect as we get into, um, you know, the partnership or the collaboration. Then the other group, um, which comes you know, to support and complement what happens in the, in the government sphere. Um, 
we recognize the fact that our sizes, you know, the kind of expertise and systems that we have from outside enables us, or rather enable us to innovate and accelerate what should be happening in the government sphere. Uh, but importantly, emphasize the fact that we're not there to take over, but we're there to support and to complement what happens in the space. In reality, in practice, as we all know, there's all sorts of egos, you know, we carrying around ourselves here, yeah, as well as government. Sometimes we go with good ideas, and government think, ah, we're not going to do that. We we'll stick to our annual performance plan. You know, sometimes we walk in there and say we have the money. We're going to tell government what to do, even even though that's not useful to them. We just will continue doing that. So that framework seeks to you know clear those sorts of you know tensions. You, you know, it doesn't. And it will not clear those tensions, you know, entirely. But it just creates a framework and some language that we can use um, to foster, you know, collaboration. Then I said, you know, some priority some priority areas have been identified to uh, focus on, and those are organised around six thematic areas. Those th themes have actually been decided upon, um, um, you know, from three sources. The first one is the National Development Plan, uh, which dedicates the whole chapter, Chapter 9 on education. So we've gone through that to understand what the NDP requires us to do in education. Secondly, we've gone through the education, uh, sorry, the uh, action plan, this is the education sector plan, action plan towards 2025 to see what the department wants to do. So in a sense, we try to fork out the reform agenda from these two documents. Thirdly, we took the outcomes of the dialogue of 2012 and put them together to understand what the key issues are. Um, so we came up with those themes. Uh, the first being the professionalization of the teaching service. And you know, I think this country has to, you know, converse, dialogue seriously about what we mean by professionalizing teaching. We, we found spaces, you know, complain about how our teachers are not professional, but I think we still don't have a common understanding of what professionalization is. Professionalization will go beyond just training teachers. As a matter of fact, the teacher unions, you know, consider that as one of them, but they bring issues of salaries, you know, conditions of service into the whole, you know, concept of professionalization. Generally, I don't think that the civil society and the nation has a clear definition of what professionalization is, nor a common understanding of the role that teachers should play in our society. And I think we need to get that debate going. Who are teachers in society? What role should they be playing? And therefore, what role should we be playing to promote that common you know, understanding and therefore have teachers you know, do uh, contribute optimally to um, you know, development. The second theme uh, focuses on promoting courageous and effective leadership. So there's over 24,000 principals in this country, and if you multiply that by at least three um, you know, heads of departments in a school, you get 24 by three, you do the maths. Um, so imagine if these people we're making effective and courageous decisions every day in their schools. My take is that we will not be having the problems that we're dealing with today. So to give you an example, you know, in a recent case, imagine if these people were taking courageous and effective decisions around the employment of teachers. We will not be having posts being sold. We will not be having people who don't qualify sitting in teaching positions and management positions. Sometimes these people know what decisions to take, but the context in which they manage the schools do not encourage them to make those courageous and effective decisions. And it's a big societal issue. It's an issue that government on its own will not sort out. It's an issue that if, until we have, you know, interest of the public, you know, the, the civil society around schools and a strong accountability, you know, line between the schools and their and their uh, communities. 
we will not be able to sort out. The third revolves around improving the capacity of the state to deliver quality education. I mean, the fact is that, you know, there are gaps in the capacity of the state in the structures that are supposed to provide or deliver quality education. So, however much we complain and kick and, you know, make noises, as long as there's no capacity to deliver, we will not see the kind of support and monitoring of schools that we want to see. So that theme specifically creates space for you know, the, the, uh, the non-governmental sphere to work with government to improve that. And fortunately, um, I mean, government clearly accepts that. The minister, for one, and her senior managers, I mean, accept that there are gaps and we need to start you know, working together to close those gaps. Theme four, all of us would have worked in. We've provided a computer or books additional to the schools. And, you know, theme five, community and, and parent involvement. So I've been reflecting a lot on, on, on you know, our service delivery model. Um, you know, comparing it with service delivery models in other countries. Uh, what we're dealing here, with here in education, and I'll speak education because that's what I know, it's essentially um, a long, um, I think, standing problem across the world. And it's a long standing pro problem across the public service. In the past couple of decades, it's, it has been dealt with under the banner of public service reform. And they range, they range, there's a range of public service reform um, you know, approaches and you know, conceptual approaches and strategies that have been developed over the years. I've recently come to a conclusion that the worst has, has you know, moved to a point where they use user satisfaction and user fees to drive the quality of, of, of service delivery. Uh, it's not a model that, you know, we use in, in South Africa. It's certainly not a model that um, is part of the policies and program of, the, of, of our country. And I think it's certainly a model that we probably aren't that prepared, you know, ready, you know, to use. I think we have taken the route of using a participatory model. So if you look at school governing bodies and how we've organized the school governing bodies around the schools, our understanding has been that if you have school governing bodies, they will participate in the whole life of the school, you create accountability between the school and the householders. It hasn't worked really well. So it leaves, I think, a service delivery model that is not that really strong. And, and at the center of that is community and, and parent participation. How we exactly crack that, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's something that we have to um, you know, continue to talk about. Theme six is improved you know, learner welfare. And that theme has found its way into the six themes uh, on, you know, on the basis that there are so many learners that come to schools with huge social and psychological needs. And often those social and psychological needs are catered for, and in the end they create barriers you know, to learning. So even if you have an effective teacher, if those aren't um, you know, adequately um, you know, addressed or catered for, they end up creating a barrier, in, in uh, a learning barrier. So quickly, I mean the vision that we have um, you know, uh, adopted is working towards a situation where, the, where more than 90% of the learners achieve more than 50% of the curriculum expectations measured in, you know, in, in, you know, using maths, physical science, and language as the subjects, the process of, uh, for the entire you know, um, learning and teaching. Um, and those are translated into five educational programs, the first being district development, and that will take 80% of the work of the NECT. I'll take a, talk a little bit more about that. The second one is systemic intervention, and that has to do with identifying you know, key systemic interventions that we can help uh, the department implement and institutional, institutionalize the benefits. We, we are scoping you know, a couple there of um, systemic interventions. The third is innovation 
uh, innovation program. And the idea there is to create space within which we can implement some few innovations and make sure that they are infused into the work of the, 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 the department. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, we, in March we invited uh, ideas and indications of interest to work with the NECT on program one and program two. So on innovations, for instance, we got a proposal um, that seeks to help the department fast track the digitization of textbooks. And we think that it's an inevitable development. So we're going into that space, we're working with you know, this NGO and the department to see how we can fast track that whole digitization of, of the textbooks with huge potential benefits. The, the third is local projects, and I think it's very close to CSI. Um, when the NCT was set up in the education collaboration framework, there was a clear, clear, clear recognition and acceptance that corporate social investment work will continue to happen in its different forms. And that the NCT is not here to you know, replace any of the corporate social investment activities. So therefore, the NCT committed to contributing to um, you, you, know, uh, you know, how how CSI is conducted and very much close to what uh, Trialog and other players in the sector are doing. We've been talking to Trialog about you know, how we could partner in, 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 doing, in doing so. The last one is um, education dialogue. Uh, we believe that dialogue is important, so it's important to continue to talk to each other. And in fact, if the NDP is going to survive and live, we have to continue to talk to each other about it. Right? How we're succeeding, where there are blockages, how we need to work together. and you know, These things, partnership has to be maintained. Uh, it requires a lot of maintenance. So that whole partnership that the NDP you know, speaks about has to be maintained and, and, and therefore uh, dialogue spaces have to be created. So we've had a dialogue, the first dialogue on, in November, where we spoke about how to make schools and teaching effective, and we allowed people who come from various sectors, whether it's business, NGOs, academia, and, and government, and uh, civil society you know, at large, to talk about how we think we can make you know, our schools and teaching um, effective. So these people aren't typical education researchers. You know, these people experience education on an ongoing basis. And interestingly, they all are committed to making education improve. So some really interesting ideas I mean, have been coming up. And what, we have, what we've been able to do amongst these 42 people who make up the education dialogue group is to, to start getting them to change the tone of the conversation. So we know what the big problems are, and we know which stakeholder groups we have problems with. So we call the stakeholder groups and say, can you talk to other stakeholders in a manner that takes the conversation forward? And, and we're seeing you know, a change in the tone of, of the conversation, and hopefully that will create an environment within which the work that you do and the work of the technical work of the NCT would, um, would succeed. So those are the educational problems, but we all know that these, you know, these typical you know, core problems have to be supported. Uh, so we've got three additional problems, which are not additional, which support that. The sixth one is internal operations, you know, and we, that covers you know, finances and governance. And those are very important, and they're very important to those who put money into the trust. So and those are dealt with you know, separately. The seventh, one is strategic partnerships. So over and above this work that we're doing in the five you know, programmatic areas, we're pursuing strategic partnerships um, in support of the broad vision of the NECT and that of the NDP. The sixth one is monitoring and evaluation. So all what we do has to be monitored and evaluated. So it has to be quality assured. And in this case, we've set up an independent uh, Quality Assurance Committee that was appointed by the Trust you know, itself, um, which looks at 
the monitoring setup and the monitoring outputs you know throughout and would advise the trust on whether the NECT office and the service providers which I work with are delivering the goods and and, and that will ensure you know that the money that the third parties have invested through the NECT are properly used right so um, that's about the entire programs and that's just how we integrate them so in terms of districts we work in six districts and this these districts are in five provinces KwaZulu Natal um, Eastern Cape, Limpopo, uh, Northwest, and Pumalanga. The commonality uh, amongst those eight, I mean five uh, provinces, it's that the three are large, isn't it? Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, and Limpopo, they are large. In fact, the three constitute about over 60% of the system. The other two, Northwest, fairly okay, performs well, medium size, Pumalanga, you know, we know the problems of the past, but it's coming along. But those particular districts will have, you know, some particular challenges uh, in terms of education quality delivery. So those have been chosen partly on the basis of need, but also on the basis of um, their absorptive capacity. So we kind of looked at whether they had the capacity to receive the interventions and to make the best out of the intervention. So a combination of that. There has been a lot of you know back and forth um, and qualitative discussions about uh, you know how we choose those districts. So we ended up with those six. The idea is that we need to end up working in twenty districts. So you know twenty districts which make up thirty three percent of the system, they are large. Even those eight districts actually make up seventeen percent of the districts or the system for that matter. Um, so it's a big, 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 ambitious, um, you know, program. We're not going to rush into the, um, the balance of the, of the districts. We're going to carefully monitor the pace at which we implement in the first eight districts, as well as establish if we have the capacity in the country to continue to the other districts. And in fact, we're starting to see cracks. So we don't have the typical capacity that we need to go to 20 districts at a go. And, and that's one thing that we've always you know, set ourselves to watch. So what do we want to do in districts? Uh, there's so many people with so many ideas, and I think very good ideas, uh, and I think typical of many sectors. If you ask the educationists on how to turn education around, you will have 101 answers. So I don't have a problem with that, because you find that in economics, isn't it? If you find, if I ask economists on how to, you know, grow the economy, you'll get 101 answers. And economists are known to have five hands. So on the one hand, you do this, on the other hand, you do that, and so on. So when we started um, putting together the district uh, improvement work, there were so many ideas. And those who were putting forward the ideas, I mean, felt that, you know, very strong about the ideas, and we, were, we didn't want to dumb down um, you know, the uh, innovation. So what we did was to agree on uh, two parts of the program. The first is the, what we call the core program, and the second is secondary you know, program. The core program is what the NECT will try and fund, uh, whilst the secondary program would actually be funded through additional partnership activities, and we hope that many of you will come on board to plug in and do the kind of things that you want to do or you do best um, under the secondary program guided by the six thematic areas. So, but the core program, um, we, we've agreed on outcome areas uh, which has you know, primary school program focusing on those three you know, areas, high school program, and what we call fresh start school program. So the Fresh Start School program, the whole essence is to identify those schools within the district which require agent and focus attention. These are the schools that will typically not benefit from a generic program. So you want to give them you know, focused attention, you want to be responsive to the kind of needs that they have. If it's a drug problem or conflict or poor content knowledge or 
some sprucing up of the infrastructure, whatever, you give them that particular uh, requirement they have. So um, that just gives you the numbers. Uh, quick, I did say, you know, 17% of the system, so between 17 and 18%, depending on what you base it on, whether it's schools or learners or teachers. Um, an important aspect is that, you know, we, we, the, 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 the people we work with, we're not asking them to go and change those 4,362 schools in three years. Look, we've done this work. We've looked at research and we, we have a realistic. So the idea is that they've got to work with the district, help to fix what needs to be fixed in the district, whether it's by way of training district officials or creating programs for the district officials, in order for the districts to work more effectively with their entire schools, right? And that's achievable over three years. But then, in the course of doing that, those isolated schools, the Fresh Start School programs, that's where we would want to see significant, tangible, and sustainable change directly caused by the, the program. So that's the practicality behind the design of the program. And quickly on talent mobilization, uh, we've gone through a very uh, methodical and transparent process of identifying the service providers that are working with the districts. So in each district, we have identified what we call lead agencies, and those lead agencies should have the capacity to design the interventions as well as coordinate the work of other service providers. So firstly, we've profiled the district. Secondly, we've called stakeholder meetings, and then we had called for proposals. We had two rounds, we were public in newspapers, and we, used, we sent direct invitations to about over 400 people who we know to do work in that area. Then we had districts, established district steering committees headed by independents who have interest in education, representing business, uh, you know, unions, and you, you name them. So a replica of the NCT at district level. We've reviewed those proposals, we've engaged the lead uh, agencies, and we've given them the space to carry out an inception phase, which provides for them to focus on some quick wins as well as plan for the coming three years. So we're busy reviewing the three-year plans at the moment with an intention to roll out um, in, in to ramp up in the second half of this year. I think it's important, it has been important for us to go through that process so that South Africans are sure that we have gotten the best of the best capacity to work in those districts. Um, those are some of the updates, I mean, you know, renovation of the schools, which are done by, you know, some departments, and we've just started, you know, serving as a catalyst for intergovernmental collaboration that is beyond, you know, the DBE. So there's a range of things that are happening, including putting in place some, you know, youth and, you know, specialists that focus on psychosocial, you know, services to schools, administrators in schools, where schools don't have administrators. I mean, we've come across schools that would have 1,500 learners and they would have no single administrator, which makes um, curriculum delivery very challenging, you know. <coughs> so there's people working, 1,563 have been in the field since the end of April. That's just the governance structure, patrons, trustees, dialogue, you know, SA, the executive and, and district, you know, steering committee. I must just say that the NECT has been designed as a small core, uh, with a small core staffing. So we're not going to grow beyond 10 you know, people. And we're not going to do the work ourselves. We're going to find the best people in South Africa to do the work. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So, I mean, that's just to show you some of the key you know, problems. I don't have the time to go through the, um, the entire slide, but you see that some of the districts are sitting without subject advisors, which are supposed to take care of schools. You know, others have high ratio of schools to subject advisors, which makes it more difficult to actually make the kind of impact we want or to sustain such impact. These challenges, you know, the department is busy dealing with them. We've highlighted them, and we all agree that we need to have sufficient at least minimum capacity at district level 
to drive those problems, right? Um, so towards uh, conclusion, many of you would have seen the research on Anglo, which has spent, what, 100 million over the past seven years. And I think it was on the star, the, the heading of that article read like, Anglo school project barely helped. He spent, you know, 100 million. So, you know, it hits you. It hit me as one of the persons who work in this space. Uh, so, and it's easy to spend money and not see anything out. But there are a couple of questions we need to ask. So, the first is, is it true? And please go and read the report and make the conclusion for yourself. And if it's true, why? Right? And, 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 and then what next? I just think that what we do in social development or in development broadly is a very complex, um, um, we are involved in a very complex phenomenon. So some of these evaluations actually fail to pick up the complexity or the complexities of the phenomenon, phenomena we are dealing with. Um, there are so many variables in the work that we do. So the, whatever you do uh, as CSI, will depend, for instance, on how organized that district is, or the school, labor, you know, influence, poverty levels, and so on and so forth. So, you know, this kind of analysis will tell you whether there's been a change or not, but they were highly unlikely to tell you why there's been that magnitude of change or not. So, I think, you know, these kind of findings have to be read with, within, you, within that context. We think, uh, and I mean, I'm not going to talk about the study, but the study looked at different small projects and so on. Indeed, the 100 million was spent, but it was spent through different projects. But what it doesn't tell us is which projects worked and which ones didn't work, and why they worked, and how we could be learning from those. So perhaps that's what we have to keep on doing. Uh, but the message that is sending is that we're going to have to be very, very careful about how we design and implement this problem. Problem, so that we do indeed see some, you know, <clears throat> impact. So we think that focused, coherent, in-depth and relentless collaborative efforts aimed at making improvements in the six thematic areas in the education framework will go a long way in actually showing some tangible and sustainable changes. I think some of the key ingredients for success, one is, you know, fixing the system. We've got to fix some bit of the system so that we don't keep coming back. And fixing is very hard because you're going to trample on other people's toes. People who don't believe some things have to be fixed. There's a lot of convincing, you know, that has to be done and so on. At the same time, we're going to have to drive improvement and show that we can improve the performance of the schools and the learners as we fix, we do the fixing. Secondly, effective, you know, programming is very important. So we have lots of ideas, but ideas will bear fruit if we probably, properly program those ideas into implementable, you know, sufficiently funded you know, interventions. And a mix of both, uh, maintaining a focus on a mix of both technocratic and non-technocratic interventions. When we spoke to um, about 40 key players in education before the dialogue in 2012, almost all of them said the role of unions. So, and it's important, you know. The role of unions determine the extent to which our technocratic interventions succeed. So there is a need to, at the same time, deal with this non-technocratic stuff, uh, which takes time to change, and I think we must have a go at it. The last is, we know that if you don't have a fair amount of authority, you can take teachers for training, you can show them how to do things better. If it doesn't come with the necessary authority, it just doesn't get done. So this whole collaboration which puts the government at the center and you know, brings that you know, sense of authority that we need to drive the interventions. I said to us conclusion, the very last slide, it's to answer the question, will the NECT crowd out NGO and, and, uh, and CSI activities? I mean, earlier on, I spoke about lead agencies. The reason why we've engaged lead agencies in those districts 
It's because we want to leave spaces for other NGOs and consultants to come and play with those districts. So as a matter of fact, in the contracts that we have with the lead agencies, we've said to them, they may not spend more than 50% of the budgets um, allocated to each district using their own resources. So they have to draw from other, you know, the pool of other you know, players in the, in the space. So NGOs that know, you know, has, it what, has what it takes, will definitely get a you know, space in the implementation of this problem. So they will not be crowded out, and particularly um, that the NECT is not set up to do any work. The NECT is set up to coordinate and monitor the implementation of that work. So the actual implementation will still be done by those who are in that space. And what about CSI activities? Um, for, for the information that, I mean, for those, we've spoken to a couple of uh, corporates, and those who gave us information on, you know, how much is expected of them to contribute to the NECT, and what percentage of that, you know, is. Uh, you know, I've given you that information. And all in all, it's about 8% of the allocated CSI budgets, which will be channeled to the NECT. And in fact, the NECT contribution is based on a 0.004% of market cap uh, of those uh, individual corporations. So there's going to be a dent, you know, but not a huge dent. Otherwise, that 8% will be re-channeled to the very same you know, sector, which would involve the same, very same players but in a different um, uh, mode. Many of those who are contributing have actually gone to find additional money to contribute to the NECT. It's either through their BE schemes or whatnot. So there's going to be a dent on CSI activity, but not, that dent would not be more than 8%. And of course, we would differ from one um, you know, company to the other. I thought I'd finish much earlier, but thank you so much. Yeah.